Confucianism, as well as Buddhism, strives to explain what the one mind is, but unless life itself conforms to those explanations, Buddhist or Confucian, we cannot call ourselves knowers of the mind, even though every one of us is in possession of it. The reason why those who are devoting themselves to the study of the Tao are yet unable to see into its ultimate significance is due to their relying on mere learning. If they really wish to see the one mind, a deep Khufu is needed. A personal observation. Khufu is not just thinking with the head, but the state when the whole body is involved in and applied to the solving of a problem. Rodin's The Thinker is typical. The Japanese often talk about asking the abdomen, or thinking with the abdomen, or seeing or hearing with the abdomen. This is Khufu. The head is detachable from the body, but the abdomen, which includes the whole system of the viscera, symbolizes the totality of one's personality. It may not be uninstructive, I think, in this connection, to notice how Rodin's The Thinker is differentiated from Sekaku Zen Master in meditation. Both are intently engaged in concentrating the mind on a subject of the utmost interest or significance. But Rodin's figure seems to me at least to be on the plane of relativity and intellection, while the oriental one is somewhere beyond it. We also have to notice the difference in the posture assumed by each one of the two thinkers. The one sits on a raised seat, while the other squats on the ground. The one is less in contact with earth than the other. The Zen thinker is rooted in the foundation, as it were, of all things, and every thought he may cherish is directly connected with the source of being from which we of the earth come. To raise oneself from the ground even by one foot means a detachment, a separation, an abstraction, a going away to the realm of analysis and discrimination. The oriental way of sitting is to strike the roots down to the center of the earth and to be conscious of the great source where we have our whence and whither. Again we return to the letter and the topic, where to locate the mind. The question is often asked, where is the mind or attention to be directed? When it is directed to the movements of the opponent, it is taken up by them. When it is directed to his sword, it is taken up by the sword. When it is directed to striking down the opponent, it is taken up by the idea of striking. When it is directed to your sword, it is taken up by that. When it is directed to defending yourself, it is taken up by the idea of defense. When it is directed to the pose the opponent assumes, it is taken up by it. At all events, they say they do not know just where the mind is to be directed. Some would say, wherever the mind is directed, the whole person is liable to follow the direction and the enemy is sure to take full advantage of it, which means your defeat. It is, after all, better to keep the mind in the lower part of the abdomen just below the navel, and this will enable one to adjust oneself in accordance with the shifting of the situation from moment to moment. This advice is reasonable enough, but from the ultimate point of view which is held by Buddhists, it is still limited, it is not the highest, it is not the supreme end of training. While being trained, the keeping of the mind in the lower region of the abdomen may not be a bad idea, but it is still the stage of reverence, and it also corresponds to what Mencius advises, to get the runaway mind back in its original seat. As to the runaway mind, I have explained it in another letter for your inspection. A note on the text. Hoshin in Japanese, Fangshin in Chinese, Ho or Fang means free and unrestrained, running wild, gone loose, lost, letting go. Mencius says that love is human mind or heart, and justice is human path. It is a pity that people leave the path and do not observe it, that people let go the mind and do not seek it. When they let loose chickens or dogs, they know they must search for them, but when they let go the mind, they do not know that they must search for it. The way of learning is no more or less than searching for the heart they have let go of. 
Kokoro means both mind and heart, intellect and affection, and is also often used in the philosophical sense as subject, substance or soul. Wherever mind is mentioned in this letter of Takuans, it is to be understood in its comprehensive sense. To return to the letter, Takuan writes, If you try to keep the mind imprisoned in the lower region of the abdomen, the very idea of keeping it in one specified locality will prevent the mind from operating anywhere else, and the result will be the contrary to what had been first intended. Then the question may arise, if keeping the mind shut up below the navel restricts its free movements, in what part of the body shall we keep it? I answer, when you put it in the right hand, it will be kept captive in the right hand, and the rest of the body will be found inconvenienced. The result will be the same when you put it in the eye, or in the right leg, or in any other particular part of the body, because then the remaining parts of the body will feel its absence. The second question is, where is the mind to be kept after all? I answer, the thing is not to try to localize the mind anywhere, but to let it fill up the whole body, let it flow throughout the totality of your being. When this happens, you use the hands when they are needed, you use the legs or the eyes when they are needed, and no time or no extra energy will be wasted. The localization of the mind means its freezing. When it ceases to flow freely as it is needed, it is no more the mind in its suchness. Localization is not restricted to the physical side of one's being. The mind may be psychologically imprisoned. For instance, one may deliberate when an immediate action is imperative, as in the case of swordsmanship. The deliberation surely interferes and stops the course of the flowing mind. Have no deliberation, no discrimination. Instead of localizing or keeping in captivity or freezing the mind, let it go all by itself freely and unhindered and uninhibited. It is only when this is done that the mind is ready to move as it is needed all over the body, with no stoppage anywhere. Zen men talk about the right, or true, show, and the partial, hen, in their teaching. When the mind fills up the body entirely, it is said to be right. When it is located in any special part of the body, it is partial, or one-sided. The right mind is equally distributed over the body, and not at all partitive. The partial mind, on the other hand, is divided and one-sided. Zen dislikes partialization or localization. When the mind is kept hardened at one place, it fails to pervade or flow over every part of the body. When it is not partialized after any schematized plan, it naturally diffuses itself all over the body. It thus can meet the opponent as he moves about, trying to strike you down. When your hands are needed, they are there to respond to your order. So with the legs. At any moment they are needed, the mind never fails to operate them according to the situation. There is no need for the mind to maneuver itself out from any localized quarters where it has been prearranged for it to station itself. The mind is not to be treated like a cat tied to a string. The mind must be left to itself utterly free to move about according to its own nature. Not to localize or partialize it is the end of spiritual training. When it is nowhere, it is everywhere. When it occupies one-tenth, it is absent in the other nine-tenths. Let the swordsman discipline himself to have the mind go on its own way, instead of trying deliberately to confine it somewhere. Let me continue now to paraphrase more of Takuan's letter, to Yagyu Tajima no Kami. The main thesis of the letter is almost exhausted in the passages which you have just heard. It consists in preserving the absolute fluidity of the mind, Kokuro, by keeping it free from intellectual deliberations and affective disturbances of any kind at all that may arise from ignorance and delusion. The fluidity of mind and prajna immovable may appear contradictory, but in actual life they are identical. When you have one, you have the other, for the mind in its suchness is at once movable and immovable. It is constantly flowing, never stopping at any point. And yet there is in it a center never subject to any kind of movement, remaining forever one and the same. 
The difficulty is how to identify this center of immovability with its never stopping movements themselves. Takuan advises the swordsman to solve the difficulty in his use of the sword as he actually stands against the opponent. The swordsman is thus made to be constantly facing a logical contradiction. As long as he notices it, that is, as long as he is logically minded, he finds his movements always hampered in one way or another, which is suki, and the enemy is sure to avail himself of it. Suki literally means any space between two objects where something else can enter. A psychological or mental suki is created when a state of tension is relaxed. Therefore, the swordsman cannot afford to indulge in an idle intellectual employment when the other side is always on the alert to detect the slightest suki produced on your part. You cannot relax and yet keep the state of tension deliberately for any length of time. For this is what makes the mind stop and lose its fluidity. How then can one have relaxation and tension simultaneously? Here is the same old contradiction, though presented in a different form. When the situation is analyzed intellectually, we can never escape a contradiction in one form or another, moving and yet not moving, in tension and yet relaxed, seeing everything that is going on and yet not at all anxious about the way it may turn, with nothing purposely designed, nothing consciously calculated, no anticipation, no expectation. In short, standing innocently like a baby, and yet with all the cunning and subterfuge of the keenest intelligence of a fully matured mind. How can this be achieved? No amount of intellection can ever be of any help in this paradoxical situation. What is known as Kung Fu is the only way to reach this result. The Kung Fu is altogether personal and individualistic. It is to develop out of oneself, within one's own inner life. Kung Fu literally means to strive, to wrestle, to try to find the way out, or in Christian terms, to pray incessantly for God's help. Psychologically speaking, it is to remove all the inhibitions there are, intellectual as well as affective or emotional, and to bring out what is stored in the unconscious and let it work itself out quite independently of any kind of interfering consciousness. The Kufu, therefore, will be directed towards how to remove the inhibitions, though not analytically. If such an expression is permissible, let us say the kufu is to be cognitively carried out, a process involving one's whole person. That is to say, it is to be totalistic, growing out of the depths of one's own being. To make clear the immovability of the most mobile mind, Takuan distinguishes the original mind from the delusive mind, which is an intellectually bifurcated state of consciousness. The original mind is a mind unconscious of itself, whereas the delusive mind is divided against itself, interfering with the free working of the original mind. The original mind is Honshin, and the delusive mind is Moshin. Hon means original, primary, real, true, native, or natural, and Mo means not real, deceiving or deceived, deluded or delusive. Shin is Kokoro, that is, mind in its broadest sense. The delusive mind may be defined as the mind intellectually and affectively burdened. It thus cannot move on from one topic to another without stopping and reflecting on itself, and this obstructs its native fluidity. The mind then coagulates before it makes a second move, because the first move still lingers there which is a suki for the swordsman, the one thing that is to be avoided with the utmost scrupulosity. This corresponds to the mind conscious of itself, ushin, no shin in Japanese. To be conscious is characteristic of the human mind as distinguished from the animal mind. But when the mind becomes conscious of its doings, it ceases to be instinctual and its commands are colored with calculations and deliberations. This means that the connection between itself and the limbs is no longer direct, because the identity of the commander and his executive agents is lost. When dualism takes place, the whole personality never comes out as it is in itself. Takuan calls this situation stopping, halting, or freezing. 
one cannot bathe in solid ice, he would warn us. Consciousness and its consequent dichotomy brings rigidity to the freely flowing original mind, and the delusive mind begins functioning, which is fatal to the life of the swordsman. The conscious mind is Ushin no Shin, contrasting with Mushin no Shin, mind unconscious of itself. Mushin literally means no mind. It is the mind negating itself, letting go itself from itself. A solidly frozen mind allowing itself to relax into a state of perfect unguardedness. Now we resume Takuan's own words, describing Mushin no Shin, the mind of no mind. A mind unconscious of itself is a mind that is not at all disturbed by affects of any kind. It is the original mind and not the delusive one that is chock full of affects. It is always flowing, it never halts, nor does it turn into a solid. As it has no discrimination to make, no affective preference to follow, it fills the whole body, pervading every part of the body and nowhere standing still. It is never like a stone or a piece of wood. It feels, it moves, it is never at rest. If it should find a resting place anywhere, it is not a mind of no mind. A no mind keeps nothing in it. It is also called munen, no thought. Mushin and munen are synonymous. A note on the text. Mushin or munen is one of the most important ideas in Zen. It corresponds to the state of innocence enjoyed by the first inhabitants of the Garden of Eden, or even to the mind of God when he was about to utter his fiat, let there be light. Eno, the sixth patriarch of Zen, emphasizes Mushin or Munen as most essential in the study of Zen. When it is attained, a man becomes a Zen man, and, as Takuan would have it, he is also a perfect swordsman. To return to the letter. When Mushin or Munen is attained, the mind moves from one object to another, flowing like a stream of water, filling every possible corner. For this reason, the mind fulfills every function required of it. But when the flowing is stopped at one point, all the other points will get nothing of it, and the result will be a general stiffness and obduracy. The wheel revolves when it is not too tightly attached to the axle. When it is too tight, it will never move on. If the mind has something in it, it stops functioning, it cannot hear, it cannot see, even when a sound enters the ears or a light flashes before the eyes. To have something in mind means that it is preoccupied and has no time for anything else. But to attempt to remove the thought already in it is to refill it with another something. The task is endless. It is best, therefore, not to harbor anything in the mind from the start. This may be difficult, but when you go on exercising Khufu towards the subject, you will after some time come to find this state of mind actualized without noticing each step of progress. Nothing, however, can be accomplished hurriedly. We paraphrase again. Takawan here notes an ancient poem on some phase of romantic love. To think that I am not going to think of you any more is still thinking of you. Let me then try not to think that I am not going to think of you. Before we part with Takawan, I wish to touch upon what may be regarded as an eternal paradox, which may run like this. How can one keep the mind in this state of no thinking when its function is to think. How can the mind be at once a mind and a not-mind? How can A be simultaneously both A and not A? The problem is not only logical and psychological, it is also metaphysical. The swordsman may have it solved in the most concrete and practical way, for it is for him a matter of life and death whereas most of us can assume a more or less intellectual attitude and remain indifferent, as it were. But philosophically it concerns us in various ways, and it also constitutes the crucial point in the study of Oriental thought and culture. The question has never been presented to the Western mind, I believe, in the way the East faces it. Tradition has it that Yagyu Tajima no Kami Munenori left a poem to one of his sons expressive of the secret of his school of swordsmanship. 
The poem is a poor one from the literary point of view, as poems of this nature, known as doka, poems of Tao, generally are. It runs thus. Behind the technique, know that there is the spirit. It is dawning now. Open the screen. And lo, the moonlight is shining in. We may say this is highly mystical. The strangest thing, however, is, what has the art of swordplay, which, bluntly speaking, consists in mutual killing, to do with such content as is communicated in the poem on the moon at the break of day? In Japan, the dawn moonlight has rich poetical associations. Yagyu's allusion to it is understandable from this angle, but what has the sword to do with poetry about the moon? What inspirations is the swordsman expected to get from viewing the moon as the day dawns? What secret is here? After going through many a tragic scene, which the man must no doubt have witnessed, with what poetic enlightenment is he expected to crown all his past experience? The author is here telling us, naturally, to have an inner light on the psychology of swordsmanship. Yagyu, the master, knows that technique alone will never make a man the perfect sword player. He knows that the spirit, ri, or inner experience, satori, must back the art, which is gained only by deeply looking into the inmost recesses of the mind, kokoro. That is why his teacher, Takuan, is never tired of dilating on the doctrine of emptiness, shunyata, which is the metaphysics of mushin, no shin the mind of no mind. Emptiness or no-mindness may appear to some to be something most remote from our daily experience, but we now realize how intimately it is related to the problem of life and death, with which most of us nowadays remain unconcerned. And thus ends Takuan's letter. The gist of Takuan's advice to Yagyo Tajima no Kami can be summed up by quoting his reference to Buko Kokushi's encounter with the soldiers of the Yuan invading army, which Takuan mentions towards the end of his long epistle. Takuan comments on the sword cleaving the spring breeze in a flash of lightning. The uplifted sword has no will of its own. It is all emptiness. It is like a flash of lightning. The man who is about to be struck down is also of emptiness, and so is the one who wields the sword. None of them are possessed of a mind which has any substantiality, as each of them is of emptiness and has no mind, or kokoro. The striking man is not a man. The sword in his hands is not a sword, and the eye who is about to be struck down is like the splitting of the spring breeze in a flash of lightning. When the mind does not stop, the sword swinging cannot be anything less than the blowing of the wind. The wind is not conscious of itself as blowing over the trees and working havoc among them. So with the sword. Hence Buko's stanza of four lines. This empty-mindedness applies to all activities we may perform, such as dancing, as it does to swordplay. The dancer takes up the fan and begins to stamp his feet. If he has any idea at all of displaying his art well, he ceases to be a good dancer, for his mind stops with every movement he goes through. In all things it is important to forget your mind and become one with the work at hand. When we tie a cat, being afraid of its catching a bird, it keeps on struggling for freedom. But train the cat so that it would not mind the presence of a bird. The animal is now free and can go anywhere it likes. In a similar way, when the mind is tied up, it feels inhibited in every move it makes, and nothing will be accomplished with any sense of spontaneity. Not only that, the work itself will be of poor quality, or it may not be finished at all. Therefore, do not get your mind stopped with the sword you raise. Forget what you are doing and strike the enemy. Do not keep your mind on the person who stands before you. They are all of emptiness. But beware of your mind being caught up with emptiness itself. Unquote. To supplement Takuan, the following story is given to illustrate the mind of no mindness. A woodcutter was busily engaged in cutting down trees in the remote mountains. An animal called Satori appeared. It was a strange looking creature not usually found in the villages. The woodcutter wanted to catch it alive. The animal read his mind. 
You want to catch me alive, do you not? Completely taken aback, the woodcutter did not know what to say, whereupon the animal remarked, You are evidently astonished at my telepathic faculty. Even more surprised, the woodcutter then conceived the idea of striking it with one blow of his axe when the satori exclaimed, Now you want to kill me. The woodcutter felt entirely disconcerted, and fully realizing his impotence to do anything with this mysterious animal, he thought of resuming his business. The satori was not charitably disposed, for he pursued him, saying, So at last you have abandoned me. The woodcutter did not know what to do with this animal or with himself. Altogether resigned, he took up his axe, and paying no attention whatever to the presence of the animal, vigorously and single-mindedly resumed cutting trees. While so engaged, the head of the axe flew off its handle and struck the animal dead. The satori, with all its mind-reading sagacity, had failed to read the mind of no-mindness. At the last stage of swordsmanship, there is a secret teaching which is not given to any but a fully qualified disciple. Mere technical training is not enough. Proficiency in this does not go beyond apprenticeship. The secret teaching is known among the masters of a certain school as the moon in water. According to one writer, it is explained as follows, which is in truth no more than the teaching of Zen, the doctrine of Mushin. Quote, what is meant by the moon in water? This is explained variously in the various schools of swordsmanship but the main idea is to grasp the way the moon reflects itself wherever there is a body of water, which is done in a state of mushin, or no-mindness. One of the imperial poems, composed at the pond of Hirosawa, reads, The moon has no intent to cast its shadow anywhere, nor does the pond design to lodge the moon. How serene the water of Hirosawa! From this poem one must get an insight into the secrets of Mushin, where there are no traces of artificial contrivance, everything being left to nature itself. Again, it is like one moon reflecting itself in hundreds of streams. The moonlight is not divided into so many shadows, but the water is there to reflect them. The moonlight remains ever the same, even where there are no waters to hold its reflection. Again, it is all the same to the moonlight, whether there are so many bodies of water or there is just one little puddle. By this analogy, the mysteries of mind are made easier to understand. But the moon and water are tangible matter, while mind has no form and its working is difficult to trace. The symbols are thus not the whole truth, only suggestive. Unquote. From all these quotations we can see that the Oriental thought and culture lays great emphasis on the realization of a psychical state of no-mindness, mushin or munen. When this is not realized, the mind is always conscious of its own doings, which Takoan calls mind-stopping. For instead of flowing, as he says, from one object to another, the mind halts and reflects on what it is going to do or what it has already done. Recollection and anticipation are fine qualities of consciousness which distinguish the human mind from that of the lower animals. They are useful and serve certain purposes, but when actions are directly related to the problem of life and death, they must be given up so that they will not interfere with the fluidity of mentation and the lightning rapidity of action. The man must turn himself into a puppet in the hands of the unconscious. The unconscious must supersede the conscious. Metaphysically speaking, this is the philosophy of shunyata or emptiness. The technique of swordsmanship is based on its psychology, and the psychology is a localized application of the metaphysics. The Atlantic Monthly, February 1937, contains an article by a Spanish bullfighter, Juan Belmonte, telling of his own experience in the art. Bullfighting is evidently very much like the Japanese art of swordplay. His story is full of informative suggestions, and I quote part of the translator's note and Juan Belmonte's own account of the fight, for which he earned a great reputation as the foremost fighter of the day. In this fighting, 
he realized the state of mind referred to in Takwan's letter to Yagyu Tajima no Kami. If the Spanish hero had had Buddhist training, he would have an insight into prajna immovable. The note from the translator, Leslie Chatteris, runs in part, Bullfighting is not a sport, and you can't compare it to one. Bullfighting, whether you like it or not, whether you approve of it or not, is an art, like painting or music, and you can only judge it as an art. Its emotion is spiritual, and it touches depths which can only be compared with the depths that are touched in a man who knows and understands and loves music by a symphony orchestra under a great conductor. Unquote. Juan Belmonte describes his psychology at the intensest moment of his fight in the following terms. As soon as my bull came out, I went up to it, and at the third pass I heard the howl of the multitude rising to their feet. What had I done? All at once I forgot the public, the other bullfighters, myself, and even the bull. I began to fight as I had fought so often by myself at night in the corrals and pastures, as precisely as if I had been drawing a design on a blackboard. They say that my passes with the cape and my work with the muleta that afternoon were a revelation of the art of bullfighting. I don't know, and I'm not competent to judge. I simply fought as I believe one ought to fight, without a thought outside my own faith in what I was doing. With the last bull I succeeded for the first time in my life in delivering myself body and soul to the pure joy of fighting without being consciously aware of an audience. When I was playing bulls alone in the country I used to talk to them, and that afternoon I held a long conversation with the bull, all the time that my muleta was tracing the arabesques of the faina, the last stage of the fight terminating with the kill. When I didn't know what else to do with the bull, I knelt down under its horns and brought my face close to its muzzle. Come on, little bull, I whispered. Catch me. I stood up again, spread the muleta under its nose, and went on with my monologue, encouraging it to keep on charging. This way, little bull, charge me nicely. Nothing's going to happen to you. Here you are, here you are. Do you see me, little bull? What? You're getting tired? Come on, catch me. Don't be a coward. Catch me. I was executing the ideal faena, the faena that I had seen so often and in so much detail in my dreams that every line of it was drawn in my brain with mathematical exactness. The faena of my dreams always ended disastrously, because when I went in for the kill, the bull invariably caught me in the leg. It must have been some subconscious acknowledgement of my lack of skill in killing that always dictated this tragic conclusion. Nevertheless, I went on realizing my ideal faena, placing myself right between the horns of the bull and hearing the acclamation of the crowd only as a distant murmur, until at last, exactly as I had dreamed it, the bull did catch me and wounded me in the thigh. I was so intoxicated, so outside myself, that I scarcely noticed it. I went in for the kill, and the bull fell at my feet. Unquote. I may add that before Belmonte had his final encounter with the bull, his mind was in a most distracted condition. Rivalry, desire for success, sense of inferiority, feeling for the public, ready to make fun of him. So he confessed. I was overcome with despair. Where had I got the idea that I was a bullfighter? You've been fooling yourself, I thought. Because you had some luck in a couple of noviadas without picadors, you can do anything. Out of this feeling of despair, however, Belmonte discovered something else in him lying hitherto altogether unsuspected when he saw his bull coming out and confronting him. This something sometimes came out of his dreams. That is, it was sleeping deeply in his unconscious, but it never came out in the broad daylight. The feeling of despair pushed him to the very edge of his mental precipice from which he finally leaped, and the result was... I was so intoxicated, so outside myself, that I scarcely noticed it. Not only that he was wounded, but, in fact, everything. Prajna Immovable was his guide. He left himself entirely to its guidance. Bukoku Kokushi, a noted Zen master of the Kamakura era, sings, The bow is broken. Arrows are all gone. This critical moment, no fainting heart cherish. Shoot with no delay. 
Here is another poem by the same author on the same subject. No targets erected, no bows drawn, and the arrow leaves the string. It may not hit, but it does not miss. When a shaftless arrow is shot from a stringless bow, it will surely penetrate the rock as once happened in the history of the Far Eastern people. In all departments of art, as well as in Zen Buddhism, this passing of the crisis is considered very important in order to reach the source of all creative works. The Shinkage Ryu used to be one of the most popular schools of swordsmanship in the feudal days in Japan. It started in the Ashikaga era. Its founder claimed that he learned the secrets of his art directly from the god of Kashima. It no doubt has gone through stages of development since then, and the so-called secrets must have increased in volume. For we have at the present day a variety of documents given by the masters to their most proficient pupils who were considered worthy of them. Among such documents we find phrases and epigrams in verse highly flavored with Zen, which have superficially no connection whatever with the use of the sword. The final certificate, for instance, which is given to one qualified to be a master of the school, contains nothing but a circle. This is supposed to represent a mirror bright and altogether free from film and dust, and its meaning is no doubt the allusion to the Buddhist epistemology of the great perfect mirror wisdom, which is no other than the prajna immovable of Takuan already mentioned. The swordsman's mind must be kept entirely free from selfish affects and intellectual calculations, so that original intuition is ready to work at its best, which is a state of no mindness. Mere technical skill in the use of the sword does not necessarily give one full qualification as a swordsmaster. He must once realize the final stage of spiritual discipline, which is to attain no mindness symbolized as a circle empty of contents a circle with no circumference. There is a phrase, among other highly technical terms, in the secret documents of the Shinkage Ryu school of swordsmanship, which has apparently no connection with the art as far as its literal meaning is concerned. As all these secrets are orally transmitted and as I am a stranger to them, it is beyond my conjecture to find out how this particular phrase obtains its organic signification in the actual wielding of the sword. But so far as I can judge, the phrase is derived from Zen literature outside which it cannot mean anything. It reads, Waters of the West River. A commentator who evidently does not know the real purport of it interprets it as indicating a bold, venturesome, daredevil attitude of mind that does not recoil from swallowing up the whole river. This is ridiculous, to say the least. It refers to a Zen mondo that took place between Baso of the Tang dynasty and his lay disciple, Ho Koji. Ho asked, What kind of man is he who does not keep company with anything or anybody? I will tell you, said Baso, when you have swallowed up in one gulp all the waters of the West River. This is said to have opened the mind of Ho to a state of enlightenment. When we have this incident in mind, we can understand why the phrase Waters of the West River has found its way into the secret documents of the school of Shinkage Ryu. Ho's question is a very important one, and so is Basso's answer. In Zen discipline this mondo is frequently referred to, and there is no doubt that among the swordsmen of the feudal days there were many who gave their lives to the study of Zen in order to attain a state of absolute no-mindness in connection with their art. As has been mentioned elsewhere, the thought of death proves to be the greatest stumbling block in the outcome of a life-and-death combat. To transcend the thought that is a great inhibitory factor in the free and spontaneous exercise of the technique acquired, the best way for the swordsman is to discipline himself in Zen. No amount of swinging the sword will ever qualify the man to swallow up the whole West River. It is Zen that performs this miracle, and until its successful performance takes place, no one is expected to do away with the ever-haunting consciousness of the ghost called death. Zen is not a mere philosophical contemplation on the evanescence of life, but a most practical entrance into the realm of non-relativity, where a cupful of tea in my hand, when spilt, fills in no time the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean, 
to say nothing of small rivers in some remote corners of the planet. The secret documents also contain a number of waka, versified epigrams, in regard to the mastery of swordsmanship, some of which decidedly reflect the spirit of Zen. Here are seven of these waka. Into a soul absolutely free from thoughts and emotions, even the tiger finds no room to insert its fierce claws. One and the same breeze passes over the pines on the mountain and the oak trees in the valley. And why do they give different notes? Some think that striking is to strike, but striking is not to strike, nor is killing to kill. He who strikes and he who is struck, they are both no more than a dream that has no reality. No thinking, no reflecting, perfect emptiness, yet therein something moves, following its own course. The eye sees it, but no hands can take hold of it. The moon in the stream, this is the secret of my school. Clouds and mists, they are mid-air transformations. Above them eternally shine the sun and the moon. Victory is for the one, even before the combat, who has no thought of himself, abiding in the no-mindness of great origin. These statements are all in correspondence with the principle of emptiness as taught by Miyamoto Musashi, who died in 1645. Yagyu Tajima no Kami Munenori and the other great masters as the ultimate secret of swordsmanship, which is attainable only after a long, arduous training in the art. This insistence on the spiritual discipline entitles the art to be called creative. Musashi was great not only as a swordsman, but as a sumie painter. In a moment you will hear some more poems showing how the spirit and even to a certain extent the philosophy of Zen has influenced the masters of swordsmanship. They are, of course, not philosophers. They never try to discuss the philosophy in connection with their discipline, for what they aim at has nothing to do with the conceptual understanding of the doctrine of emptiness or suchness, but its personal experiential grasp as they face the problem of life and death in the form of the threatening sword in the hands of an opponent. The philosopher may take this so-called opponent or enemy not concretely as the swordsman does, but more in the form of concepts such as an objective world or ultimate reality or the saying or the given or the brute fact or l'en soi or what not. The thinkers grapple with these unknown quantities making use of every available source of learning and thinking, but the swordsman's problem is far more urgent and ominous and allows him no time for reflection and erudition. He has to decide with no delay. His courage is not something he can muster after much deliberation. The question is at the door, over the head, sizzling the eyebrows. If the answer is not forthcoming, all is ruined. The situation here is more critical than the philosophers.